Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Maryland Native Plant Society webinar, Native Grasses, Sedges, and Rushes for Gardens and Landscapes with Suzanne Hill. I'm Ann DeNovo. I'll be your host this evening together with my co-host, Lynn Parsons. This evening's program will be the last Maryland Native Plant Society webinar in this format produced by the current team of volunteers. I want to take a moment now to recognize and thank the people who have produced the webinars since the summer of 2020. It really has been a team effort. And first of all, I want to recognize and thank Marnie Bruce, the longtime program chair for the Maryland Native Plant Society, who has a wonderful gift for finding great speakers and identifying topics that will appeal to the wide range of interests in MNPS. Also, all of our thanks and gratitude go to our tech support expert volunteer, Lynn Parsons, for her expertise and her patience and all she has taught us. We never could have done this without her. <laughs> I also want to recognize and thank Liz McDowell, the coordinator of the Western Mountains chapter of MNPS, who has brought us a couple of other wonderful speakers and helped with many other aspects of the production. And Kirsten Johnson, who has helped us with the Maryland Native Plant Society website, registration and other issues. Also Liz Matthews, who posted to Meetup and all of the dozens of people who helped us with our tests and our practice sessions and gave us valuable comments and feedback. We have really enjoyed bringing you these educational programs and we hope that they have enhanced your appreciation and enjoyment of native plants during this time of pandemic. Okay, so if you uh, go on to YouTube, um, the, the way that I think is easiest to show everyone, I'm just going to search, well, it's actually um, displayed here, but Mar you search for Maryland Native Plant Society. And once you do that, it's going to come up with the most recent videos, but it also has our channel. And if you click on the channel, then you have the most recent videos, six of them displayed here, and you can look and see there's six more. But what about all those historical videos? Where are they? Um, you need to click the videos tab and then you will be able to see the entire library. If you search for them, if you know the name of the presenter or the name of the, um, the presentation, you should have no trouble. But it's when you go to the home screen that you're a little confused because you only see a subset. And I would like to take just a second longer, Anne, um, because I just wanted to share my gratitude to the sharp, cooperative, adventuresome, and willing to compromise group that invited me to join them as fellow pioneers on this adventure at the onset of COVID lockdown. I had the distinct privilege to work with Anne, Marnie, Liz, Kirsten, Karen, Jill, Deborah Barber, and too long a list of practice session volunteers for me to remember. What a tremendous learning experience it was for a green wannabe native plant botanist. To top that off, I got close enough to rub Zoom elbows with all the brilliant presenters currently listed for us on the MNPS YouTube channel that I just showed you and on the Facebook page. I feel I would be remiss if I did not highlight one partner in particular, Anne DeNovo. I feel confident that no one would disagree that she put in the lion's share of time, effort, coordination, and research in bringing you the many polished presentations you've so enjoyed. This was done on technology that was new to all of us. She mastered how to navigate the plethora of evolving features of Zoom with feedback from our uh, practice session team and isolated those features most useful to provide a meaningful webinar for our audience. She coordinated and led our many virtual meetings and through these we prepared ourselves and the presenters with what to expect and how to address the inevitable technology pitfalls 
as a supposed technology advisor, I would think I'd found the suitable solutions, but Anne would consistently drive it further to perfection. And for that, we can all be grateful. Many, many thanks, my COVID pal, Anne. I will think of these special times often as I rewatch all the great recordings. And one final expression of gratitude to our faithful and patient audience whom I've gotten to know better in the chat. I hope to see you all in person on a walk one day soon. Thank you so much, Lynn, and I second that. We all hope we can go on walks together soon. In the meantime, and even after that, you can also access the webinar recordings by going to the Maryland Native Plant Society website under events and then webinar recordings. All of the links are there. And now I'm very happy to introduce our speaker for tonight, our final program. Suzanne Hill is from Frederick, Maryland. She first became a master gardener more than 20 years ago in Minnesota, and she has continued as a master gardener both in Minnesota and in Maryland. She's a master naturalist. She has spent many years studying, appreciating, enjoying, and promoting native grasses. She has given presentations to the Western Mountain chapter of Maryland Native Plant Society and to numerous other gardening groups. So take it away, Suzanne, you can start sharing your screen. Well, good evening, everyone. And I'm very excited to ex tell you about some of my favorite plants, our native grasses, sedges, and rushes for gardens and landscapes. And I want to also express my gratitude to the Maryland Native Plant Society for giving me this opportunity to share these plants that I love so much. Many times when we go to the um, garden centers, we are distracted by the, all the pretty faces and all the pretty flowers. Well, grasses and sedges and rushes may not have the prettiest flowers, but they have their own beauty and they have many wonderful uses in our home landscapes and gardens. And in addition, you may be surprised to learn how many ecological services they provide. So I'm gonna talk about native graminoids, and that's a, a term that means all grass-like plants, so I don't have to say the names every single time. So why do you want to grow them? Well, there are a lot of reasons. There are, they are perennials, so you won't have to plant them every year, and that will save you time and money. And as you can see in the picture of the little blue stem, they can offer three season beauty. Not only do they have structure and form and seasonal color changes, they will sway and whisper in the wind. And the motion in the garden can be quite wonderful. These grasses are adapted to Maryland's particular climate, soils and geographic regions. They don't need fertilizing. Once established, you don't need to give them any additional water. They don't need to be staked or deadheaded unless you want to prevent reseeding. And they provide lots of habitat for wildlife. They can be used for erosion control and they have so many ways to be used in a garden. For example, this is a Eastern meadowlark nest in the grass. And this is a bumblebee nest in the grass. And there's a little fawn waiting for its mother. Did you know that the new queen bumblebees often overwinter at the base of native grasses? They and many other insects and small mammals seek shelter under grasses. There are many new um, cultivars of our native grasses sedges on the market, and these do not lodge or fall over. And this might be appropriate for along a narrow walkway, but they are not going to provide the shelter for wildlife that the, that the straight species will do. Here's a good reason to have a dense planting of sedges along the stream. They make a perfect landing pad for these little ducklings. And in addition, they control erosion and, bank, and stabilize the bank of the stream. Many of the grasses and sedges are um, host plants for lepidopterans, and these caterpillars are food for baby birds. In addition, the seeds are relished by birds and many small mammals. Native Americans made beautiful baskets using our graminoids. Many of the native grasses have very deep roots. And this diagram is very um, informative. The large arrows point to Indian grass and big blue stems. See how deep those roots go down to nine, 10 feet. These roots stabilize the soil. They prevent wind and water erosion. 
and they are bringing minerals from deep in the soil up to the surface for use by the graminoid plants and their neighbors. In addition, they can sequester large amounts of carbon in the soil. The middle arrow shows the puny little roots of typical lawn grass. Doesn't do much for, for um, erosion or bringing up minerals or sequestering carbon. And there are so many ways to use these graminoids in your garden. They can be a specimen plant in the garden or in a large pot. You can plant them en masse in large numbers, make a nice ground cover. They will create a contrast against say a, some dark evergreens or a solid surface like a wall. You can use them to border a walk or a garden and you can create your own prairie or meadow gardens. Some can be used in hill strips. That's that strip of land that's a hot and dry and poor soil between the sidewalk and the street, which also gets a lot of salt sometimes in the wintertime. They can be used in xeriscape gardens, such as rock and roof gardens. Many can be used in rain gardens and almost all help with erosion control. Most of you realize that Maryland is divided into three geographic regions. We have the coastal plain, sea level, the Piedmont Plateau, and then the Appalachian Mountains. I've used the letters C, P, and M to indicate the um, historic location for each of the plants I'm going to discuss, recognizing that each of these regions has different climate and soils. Now, in general, graminoids are deer resistant or rarely damaged. But remember, deer don't read plant labels and a hungry deer will eat about any plant. This year, they ate my heirloom tomatoes and left my grasses and sedges alone. Go figure. I'll also say that they don't have any serious pests or diseases. Now remember that many of the grasses and sedges are host plants for Lepidopteran. And remember that these butterflies, skippers, and moths are important incidental pollinators. Here is the fiery skipper. That is a kind of grass skipper. We don't often see these caterpillars because they feed at night and they construct a daytime retreat by rolling a, a blade of grass into a tube. When the caterpillar is fully grown, it will drop to the soil and spend the, spend the winter at the base of the grass. And if you're a gardener, you know that leaf spots happen. So in the garden, put down the spray bottle and just take a few steps back. And by magic, the, the damage just seems to disappear. I'll also mention that there are certain times of the year when it's best, best to remove old foliage. And some of us live in HOAs that require neat gardens and others live someplace where there could be fire danger in a dry spring, in which time you would want to remove some of the old foliage. However, anytime you're removing these old leaves and the dead material around the plants, you're removing the shelter that those overwintering skippers and bees and other insects are needing for protection. Remember, these insects are the little things that run the world and we leave learning that they're in danger. I like to know the meaning of the botanical names based on the, uh, the Greek and Latin roots. So here we go. Gram is Latin for grass. Po is Greek for grass and we get the Poaceae grass family. Carex is Latin for sedge. Cipher is Greek for sedge and the Cyperaceae are the sedge family members. Juncus is Latin for rush, and we get the Juncaceae, or the rush family. Now, all the graminoids are monocots. They have a single seed leaf. They have um, narrow leaves and parallel veins, and they're all wind-pollinated. It's really a thrill to come across a, a, a big blue stem or other native grass in full bloom, and these bright yellow anthers are going to produce a lot of pollen. I did not include big blue stem in this talk because it's just too aggressive for most home use. There are many mnemonics to help us determine if a plant is a grass, sedge, or rush, but this is the one I used. Sedges have edges, rushes are round, grasses are hollow and have nodes to the ground. In cross section, you can see that grasses indeed are hollow and they have rounded stems. And the stems also have nodes or, or joints and I'll show you on the next slide what that means. A grass consists of the flat blade and the sheath, and the sheath overlaps the stem, which is sometimes called a culm. The base of each leaf is where the node is, and I will show you with my arrow 
Here is the leaf and this is the node for that one. This leaf has the node here. The uh, leaves on grasses are two ranked and they alternate along the stem. In addition, I've marked with blue the rhizome. A rhizome is an underground stem and many grasses and sedges and rushes will have these. And new plants can arise from these rhizomes and this is how colonies can, can be formed by these plants. A grass inflorescence is called a florette. It's not really a flower because it doesn't have pretty petals. These um, florets are usually perfect, having both male and female parts. There are no petals, but the, the um, female part is the ovary is wrapped in two scales or bracts called the lemma and palea. There is one seed called a grain or caryopsis per floret. And I want you to notice that the uh, lemma one of the um, scales can have a long spike called an on at the end. And this will come up when we talk about bottle brush grass. The grass spikelets may contain one or many florets. And, and at the base of each spikelet are two more glooms. Remember that wheat is a grass. And when we brush and winnow wheat, we are removing the lemma, the palea, and the blooms from the plant to make it edible for us humans. I will be talking about three different kinds of grass inflorescences. A panicle in which the spikelets are spaced along branches. A racine, the sp spikelets are on short stalks along the main stem or culm. And in a spike, the spikelets are attached directly to the main comb. So let's get started with some cool season grasses. These grasses flower and grow most actively in the spring and fall, and they're evergreen to semi-evergreen in the winter months. Most prefer some shade. Did you realize that, that our lawn grasses are non-native cool season grasses? There is in fact a native cool season grass that can be, can be used for a lawn and this is mountain native red fescue or Festuca rubra. This grass needs to grow in shade and cannot take a lot of foot traffic, but it, it can be used as a lovely lawn substitute. So here's Eastern bottle brush grass, Elemis hystrix. And by the way, hystrix is Greek for hedgehog. Bottle brush grass is native to dry woodlands throughout Maryland, and it has a clumping open habit. It has evergreen foliage that will stay very nice and green even in our coldest winters. The leaves are a half inch wide and 12 inches long. The plants grow two to four feet high and spread one to two feet. In early summer, eight inch um, spikes, bloom spikes appear and they turn from green to tan. And in the picture, you can see the very showy awns that are coming off the lemma, remember? And there's a waxy coating on these seeds and on the stems, which makes them very lovely when they're backlit or against a dark, a dark background, in this, as in this picture. Bottle brush grass makes an excellent replacement for Chinese silver grass, which is not native. It's Miscanthus, Miscanthus sinensis. Bottle brush grass prefers to grow in part sun, which is four to six hours of direct sunlight, part shade, which is four to six hours of sunlight, but protected from the hot afternoon sun and shade, which is four or fewer hours of sunlight per day. It likes moist to average soils that, is well, that are well drained and it can tolerate salt, air pollution, drought, and the allelopathic black walnut tree. Many of you know that um, some plants put out chemicals in the soil to prevent other plants from growing nearby. And this is the case for black walnuts, but um, bottle, brush grass could grow underneath a black walnut tree should you have them on your property. Bottle brush has no serious pests or diseases and it's rarely damaged by deer. It's interesting that it prefers a calcium rich soil. So this would be a good choice if you have a sidewalk or a foundation made with concrete. In addition, I find this is a great place to put my seashells from the last trip to the Eastern shore. Bottle brush can be propagated by seed and by division in the spring. Bottle brush grass seeds will shatter in August to September and it will self seed to form colonies. If you don't want it to um, do this, you can cut off the seed heads before they shatter. In addition, you may want to cut off the stems just to showcase this beautiful evergreen foliage in the winter. It is our most shade tolerant grass. 
and is excellent for use in a shaded woodland garden, and it can tolerate dry shade once established, and it's excellent for erosion control. It's the host plant for many Lepidoptera, including the lovely Northern Pearlii, and it provides seeds and shelter for wildlife. It's a beauty. My husband and I enjoyed seeing it so many times this summer along the CNO Canal. Then there's beautiful, cool season sea oats. Bill Kulin uh, compared them to paper fish dangling or schools of paper fish suspended from thin wires. Northern sea oats or Casmanthium latifolium. The latifolium comes from Latin, latte meaning wide and folia leafed. And it's an upright plumping grass and it grows in sun, part sun to part shade. And it tolerates soil that can be dry or wet as long as it's fertile. Now, if you grow it in full sun, it may need a little more moisture. It can grow up to four feet high in bloom and two to three feet wide. The foliage is quite wide, three to four, three fourths of an inch wide in a lovely shade of blue green. And, this, and the leaves are attached perpendicularly to the stems, which are wiry and persistent in the winter. The leaves turn in lovely amber gold in fall. This is native throughout Maryland to shaded streams, floodplains, and low rich deciduous woodlands. It can be propagated by seed or by division in the spring. A fun name for it is spangled grass. In early summer, one inch long oat-like spikelets appear and they change from color from green to pink to bronze. And it's fun to hear them rustling in the wind and they will also shimmer. It's amazing to see them in the garden. They provide fall and winter interest as well. Sea oats are best grouped in for woodlands, for borders and rain gardens and for erosion control. They're the host plant for many skippers and they provide seeds and shelter for, for wildlife. It can be planted with, with our native iris, like the iris versicola, the um, cardinal flower, the lobelia cardinalis, turtle head, the chelone, or the um, Virginia sweet spire. Northern sea oats are rarely damaged by deer and have no serious pests or diseases. They tolerate salt, black walnut, drought, and poorly drained clay soil, which many of us in the Piedmont deal with. A little bit of a caveat here. This grass readily self-seeds and some unwanted seedlings may pop up around your garden. But there's a simple solution. Simply cut off the seed heads before they shatter and use them in dried flower arrangements in your home. They're so pretty. Wavy hair grass or Dyschampsia flexuosa is a, is a remarkable uh, grass in that it's, it's very hair-like and it, has, it forms dense arching clumps or tufts. It has fine textured semi evergreen foliage. It grows one to three feet high and about one to two feet wide. It spreads slowly via rhizomes. Remember those underground stems. It can grow in part sun, part shade and in shade. Soil can be dry to moist as long as it's well drained and it does prefer acidic soils. So that's with pH below seven. It tolerates dry shade, sandy soils, road salt and deer. And it's native to forest clearings in the coastal plain and the mountain. Somehow it skips the Piedmont. Aren't these lovely? These are the blooming panicles in May to July. Clouds of these silvery dried seed heads just glow in the sunlight and it makes a lovely um, fall and winter interest for your garden. Hair grass can be used for rock and roof gardens, for erosion control on slopes. You can group it in a shade garden with ferns and um, white wood aster with, with hookera and with phlox divericata, the woodland phlox, and then with Carex plantaginea, which I will discuss later, that is the seersucker said. Wildlife enjoy its seeds and, and, sh and shelter from its foliage, and it is also a host plant. Hair grass can be propagated by seed and can be divided in spring or fall. And again, if you want to, it can be cut back in late winter. Next, I want to talk about some warm season grasses. These would be perfect for a sunny location. These grasses flower and grow most actively in warm, dry weather would be our summer and early fall. They are very late to emerge in the spring and even into early summer. And once established, they can thrive on high temperatures and low moisture. And again, these can be cut back in early spring. This is beautiful Indian 
Brass, Sargastrum, Newtons. It was part of the four main grasses of the tall grass prairie and Indian grass is found throughout Maryland. The other grasses in the tall grass prairie were the big blue stem, the little blue stem, and switchgrass. Indian grass is an upright plumping grass and it does best in full sun. It can tolerate average to poor soils and most any texture from sand to loam, clay, gravel, and even rocky soils. It prefers dry to moist soils, but they must be well drained. It will flop or lodge is the technical term. If the soil is too wet or too fertile, or if the plant is, get, is getting too much shade, it will grow up three, to, three feet to up to eight feet in bloom and it will spread about three feet. The leaves are about a half inch wide, two feet long, and a lovely blue green that turns to a yellow orange in fall. They are marvelous plants to see in the fall. Indian grass blooms between August and September with feathery panicles that will persist into fall and winter. The uh, seed heads have a, a golden cast to them, very metallic sheen to them. that makes them quite attractive as well. Indian grass can be grown from seed and it's in mid spring. But remember with those deep roots down to nine feet, you're not going to be able to divide this grass. Again, it can be cut back in late winter, has no serious pests or diseases. Indian grass tolerates air pollution, black walnut and drought and deer. You, many wildlife use the seeds and the foliage for shelter and it's a host plant. And here you can see one of the skippers, the pepper and salt skipper who use it as a host plant. Indian grass can be used as a specimen plant in a garden, can give a vertical accent to a garden. It will help control erosion. You can plant in mass for a prairie or meadow garden, and you can combine it with some sturdy native wildflowers and other native grasses, such as little blue stem or switchgrass. Then there's little blue stem, one of my personal favorites, Schizocarium scoparium. This is an upright clumping grass that is native to open woods, pinelands and prairies throughout most of all of Maryland actually. And it can give you three season interest as I've mentioned before. And they're finally getting it. It's been named the perennial plant of 2022. So we should see a lot of these, a lot of this grass on the market next year. Little blue stem, like many of the other warm season grasses, is going to do best in full sun. And it has those deep roots down to seven feet, so it can tolerate seasonal drought once it's been established. For soil, dry to moist as long as it's well drained. And fertility, average to poor, and it can tolerate acid or alkaline soils or even neutral soils. It's not a very particular grass. It, again, like Indian grass, it will flop or fall over if the soil is too wet or rich or if it's grown in too much shade. It can grow from one and a half to four feet high in bloom and about two feet wide. The foliage is slender and a lovely gray green to blue gray that will turn a coppery red and then a lovely tan in fall and winter. Little blue stem blooms in August through October with these with three inch purplish bronze racemes. And these are followed by these lovely, fluffy, silvery white seed heads will just glow in the sunlight. The stems are wiry and they will persist in the winter, adding um, some texture and form to your winter garden. Little blue stem will readily self-seed and it can also be easily grown from seed. You may cut it back in late winter or early spring if you need to. Little blue stem tolerates air pollution and fire. Remember on the, the prairies, there are often many fires and also it tolerates black walnut. However, it is intolerant of flooding, so it would not be a good plant to put in a rain garden. Little blue stem is rarely bothered by deer, has no serious diseases or pests. Wildlife use its seeds and, and foliage for shelter, and it is also a host plant. It can be used as a specimen plant along borders and mass in a meadow or prairie garden and for erosion control on slopes, it's particularly good for that. Remember those deep roots. Next, there's switchgrass, Panicum virgatum. This was actually the dominant species on the, in the tall grass prairies. So this is native throughout Maryland in open woods, dunes, marshes, and in wet meadows. It's a stiff, clumping grass. It has a narrow form and it has a base shape. It blooms with open airy panicles that turn from pink to tan in July to September. And as you can see in the photos, it can give you three seasons of interest. 
in your garden. Switchgrass is going to do best in sun, although it will take tolerate some shade. It can take dry, moist, or even wet soils and fertility average to poor. And for texture, loam, clay, sand, or rocks, pretty tolerant. It grows three to six feet high and up to eight feet when it's in bloom. And it can be two to five feet wide. The leaves are two feet long and a half inch wide and they arch, making them quite attractive. They turn from a purplish green, and the previous picture shows that a little better, that purplish green foliage early on that will turn beige and then to a yellowish tan in winter. Again, this look at these roots. Switchgrass has fibrous roots that can go down eight to 10 feet into the soil. And there's the little blue stem next door and then the tiny little roots of the turf grass. These um, deep roots stabilize the soil, control erosion, of course, they're, they're sequestering carbon. It, switchgrass can be cut back in spring, although I think this looks a little bit like it's been butchered. And, but when you do this, remember to leave eight to 10 inches for stem nesting native bees. They use like one eighth inch to five eighth inch diameter grass stems to make their nests. And a little garden tip is that you can plant your um, spring bulbs around your grasses. And as the um, grass leaves emerge in the spring, those fading tulip and daffodil leaves will be hidden. Switchgrass has many, many uses. It's, it can spread by rhizomes, remember those underground stems, and by self-seeding to form colonies. It has no serious pests or diseases and rarely damaged by deer. Wildlife use its seeds and, and foliage for shelter, and it is the host plant to the cedar butterfly and to many skippers. Switchgrass tolerates drought, salt, and occasional flooding, perfect for a rain garden like this one in Lafayette, Louisiana. I think it's so lovely that it's planted with asters and I think those are some native iris. It can be used as an accent plant, as a living screen. I have it hiding the um, utility box in my front yard. It can be used as a, as a tall border and it can be used for erosion control and, can for, and you can use it in your own prairie or meadow gardens with asters, coneflowers, joe pie weed, baptisia, that's um, false indigo and the um, orange butterfly weed, Asclepius, tu Asclepius tuberosa. So wonderful grass. Then there's purple top grass, Tridens flavus. This is a native warm season grass found in woodland openings throughout Maryland. Many of you have been driving by this and not known what it was. This is purple top at 55 miles per hour. Purple top or red top grass likes full sun to part sun and it can tolerate most soils as long as they're well-drained. And it takes um, average to poor fertile, fertile fertility, and it can grow in loam, clay, sand, or rocks. It's an upright clumping grass. The leaves are rough or scabrous to the touch, 16 inches long and 5 eighths of an inch wide. It spreads by short rhizomes. It can grow up to four feet high and spreads about three feet. It blooms in August to October, with these airy red, purple, red or purple panicles. You have to see them up close to realize just how intensely red or purple these panicles are. They're beautiful. Purple top tolerates drought, poor soil, compaction, salt, air pollution, and even mowing up to two times a year. No wonder we see it growing, see it growing along so many of our highways. It's rarely browsed by deer, and wildlife use its seeds and to eat its seeds and use shelter, to use shelter from the leaves. It's a host plant to butterflies and moths, including the common wood nymph. You can propagate it by division or by or seed in, in if, you, if you sow the seed in the fall. It can be used in mass along roadsides, of course, but also in prairie and meadow gardens. Then there's purple lovegrass, Aragrastus spectabilis. No one knows how it got this name because it's Greek, eros in Greek is love and agrostis is grass. Perhaps the person naming it really loved this grass and spectabilis means it's just spe spectacular. It's native to the coastal plain and Piedmont in their dunes, grasslands and open woodlands. It likes full sun and it likes sand or gravelly soils that are dry to medium in moisture and well-drained. 
and it takes infertile to average fertility soil. It grows in dense clumping tufts that, that are about one to two feet high and two to three feet wide. When it blooms, the blooms come rise well above the foliage and this would be in July to October. And it blooms in these open airy panicles that are quite lovely. And they change in color from green to purple to tan, kind of the purple haze of the prairie. Purple love grass spreads by self seeding and slowly by rhizomes. In spring, it can be cut back if wanted and it can be propagated by division or seed. It's a great replacement for non-native fountain grass or penicetum. It tolerates, I mean, it tolerates so many things that look so delicate and it's so pretty and yet it's a tough plant, tolerating heat and drought, black walnut, sandy and poor soils, air pollution and road salt. Again, no serious pests or diseases and the deer seem to leave it alone. It can be used as a, for along a border, to edge a path, in a meadow, for xeriscaping, for that hell strip along the street, in a container and even in dried arrangements. If you're looking for a short visual layer in a garden, you can grow it with some little blue stem and some smaller or shorter a native uh, flowering, native, native flowering plants such as Coreopsis. It's a host plant to the Zeppelin skipper and birds relish the seeds. Now this is fun. It's also called tumble grass and petticoat climber. After flowering, the inflorescence will detach from the plant and blow around like tumbleweed. And it, as it blows along the ground, it scatters seed. The first time I grew this plant, I'm going, where did these tumbleweeds come from? And then I realized, oh, it came from my love grass. And I did not know that when I bought it. So now you have a head start on this. And it's such a lovely grass that um, Peter, Peter Odoff used them extensively in the New York Highline Garden and also in the Chicago Lurie Gardens. Next, we'll go on to some of our sedges. Sedges have edges. Well, we'll see what that means. Well, in cross section, the stems are triangular, as you can see, and they're solid, and there are no nodes or joints along the stems, and the stems are tough and wiry, which means they will have some winter presence. The leaves, also, the leaves of many of them have a distinct midrib, so if you were to slice it cross-section, you would see a V-shape to the leaf. The leaves are three-ranked and in a spiral arrangement along the stem. The Cyperaceae, or sedges, are perennial plants, mostly evergreen. They're considered cool season plants. Again, remember they do best in early, in the cool seasons, the spring and the fall. Most prefer shade and moist or wet environments. They're clump forming and they spread via rhizomes. And in the photograph, I have a blue arrow showing how they can spread via these rhizomes or underground stems. You can propagate sedges by, by um, seed or by division in spring. I have limited my talk to some to the carex, the genus carex. Um, and carex, carex flowers are unisexual. The other genera of, of sedges in the Cyperaceae in the lower left-hand picture, those have perfect flowers, but the carex are unisexual. In the middle picture, you can see the male flowers on top and the feathery female flowers at the bottom. The female flower or the ovary is surrounded by a bottle-shaped bract called the perigenium. The florets are grouped into spikes or spikelets and the fruit is called a dry akeen. And the perigenium will be perigenium we will talk about later in another sedge. This is Pennsylvania sedge or Carex pennsylvanica. And I've entered, underlined the double N and the single N and that's the way it's spelled. And I think Carex Pennsylvanica was named before they had standardized English, um, the English words. At any rate, it's a very useful sedge to have in the garden. And it's short, only growing six to 10 inches high and about 14 to 20 inches wide. It has fine grass-like semi-evergreen foliage and bloom spikes appear in early, mid to late spring. It likes part sun to full shade and tolerates dry to moist soils as long as they're well-drained well drained, and it does seem to prefer acidic soils. 
It's native to rocky woods and open sandy areas in the coastal plain in Piedmont. It is deer pest and disease resistant and once established can tolerate drought. Pennsylvania sedge spreads by rhizomes to provide a lovely ground cover in dry shade. It is so often found growing under oak trees, it has another name of oak sedge. Other uses for Pennsylvania sedge are as a, edge, as a way to edge a path or make a border around a garden in the shade. You can underplant taller shade perennials with, with a Pennsylvania sedge. You can also have a make a lawn in the dry shade using Pennsylvania sedge, but remember it cannot, it cannot take a lot of foot traffic, but you could solve this by putting in some stepping stones or pavers. It does not grow readily from seeds, so I would recommend that you purchase plants or plugs if you want to grow Pennsylvania sedge. I grow it and I love it. In the spring, you can divide larger clumps and make more of them. Here's a picture of some Pennsylvania sedge growing with sedum ternatum or woodland stone crop. As everybody knows in Frederick, that's one of my favorite plants. It also does well with woodland flocks, ferns and tiarella and many others. Wildlife use its seeds and use their foliage for shelter. It's a host plant and it's a great replacement for non-native variety or lily turf. Carex plantaginea and Latin plantago plantain gives it its common name, plantain-leafed or seersucker sedge. And those of you who ever had a, a cool seersucker sedge shirt know what that means. This plant, this sedge has form and texture in spades with these broad straps of evergreen leaves that just that this um, puckered and catches the light. It's a lovely, lovely plant. Everyone who sees it says, what is that? Um, it has an arching, clumping habit, and it will spread by rhizomes, and mine is spreading quite nicely, and it's native to the Piedmont and mountain regions. Again, it's a shorter plant, only 6 to 12 inches high and about 1 to 2 feet wide. It blooms in March, and look at the cool striped stems on this plant, burgundy and green. It's really fun. It um, tolerates rocky soils, alkaline soils, and even wet soils. But once established, it can tolerate dry shade. It's deer resistant, has no serious pests or diseases, and it's a host plant for many Lepidoptera, and birds relish its seeds. By the way, the leaf in the front is a trout lily. These, this is the leaf of the sedge. So you can grow it with trout lilies. It likes moist, well-drained, fertile soil and part to full shade. And it can be cut back in late winter before a new growth with me, I tend to just pick out the leaves, the few leaves that look the worst and leave the rest. It can be propagated by seed or by division in spring. It can be used as a ground cover for erosion control along streams, as an edger, as a specimen plant, and in mass with other shade gardens. It makes a great textural contrast to the delicate maidenhair ferns, to creeping flocks, to tiarella cordifolia, to alum root, to um, Mary Bell's and Trillium and many others. And it's a great replacement for Liriope and, and Hosta, both of which are of course non-natives. This is just an example of how beautiful this sedge is in this and grown in mass and, and edging a sidewalk. It's really striking. Here's another very ornamental plant, Carex platophylla. I think it's sort of interesting. It's a mixed metaphor, platophylla, Latin, plati meaning broad and Greek phylon for leaf. And so it's called broadleaf or silver sedge. It grows eight to 12 inches high and about one to two feet wide. The leaves are gorgeous, one inch wide, a foot long and an evergreen and they have a shiny, glorious blue gray color. It has a clumping habit and it spreads by rhizomes. It prefers moist organic soils that are well drained and it's native to the mountain and Piedmont regions and, and upland forests. Silver sedge prefers, or broadleaf sedge prefers, part shade to even deep shade. It tolerates drought, dry shade, and alkaline and rocky soils. In sp late spring, you'll get these blooms, these purple blooms, and you have indicated the male and the female parts on the picture, which is quite, it's quite striking when it's in bloom. 
and it can be propagated by seed or by division in spring. It's moderately deer resistant, not as deer resistant as others. And you can give it a haircut or just a little sprucing up in late winter. This contrasts the um, early spring when it's blooming with a gorgeous um, summer foliage. You can use broadleaf sedge or silver sedge as an edger in mass, as a ground cover and shade. You can plant it with marginal wood fern, columbine, wild ginger, woodland phlox, many others. And it's a great replacement for the non-native hosta and liriope. It's a host plant to over 35 species of Lepidoptera and wildlife use the foliage for cover and they consume the seeds. This is a very dramatic sedge. This is gray sedge or Carex gray eye. It's named after or named to honor um, Asa Gray, who was the um, leading American botanist in the 19th century and the author of Gray's Manual of Botany. Gray sedge grows in sun to part shade, a little taller, two to three feet high and about one to two feet wide. It's a clumping grass, a clumping sedge, sorry, and it has grass-like foliage with a semi-evergreen. It takes soil that's wet to moist and tolerates temporary flooding. So guess what? I think this would make a great plant for a rain garden. It is native in the Piedmont and coastal plain to low areas near rivers, bottomland forests, and it tolerates deer, drought, and wet soil. It has no known pests and it can be propagated by seed in the fall and by division in spring. Wildlife eat its seeds and use the foliage for shelter. And if you happen to have muskrats, they will come and eat their roots. It's the host to the two-spotted skipper. This is what's so interesting. In, um, May, th in May, these pistillate spikelets appear. And I, I want you to see that the, remember we talked about the sac that surrounded the ovary on um, sedges? That's these inflated, these are inflated perigenium, and you can see the delicate little stigmas sticking out of here. So this is the pistillate spikelets. They're up to an inch and a half across, and they persist into winter. You can use this plant as a specimen plant along a border. It can be used for erosion control. You can put it, of course, in that rain garden or even a bioswale. One cool plant. I think it resembles the medieval weapon, well, it was called a mace. Finally, we have rushes are round. So rushes or the Juncaceae have rounded stems or cones. And in the cross section, you can see they're round and that they're solid and the stems are unjointed. The leaves are simple and mostly basal. A rush inflorescence is um, more flower-like than the others. The floral parts are in multiples of three. Instead of petals, it has six tepals. There's a whorl of stamens, in this case there are six, and it has a three-lobed stigma, as you can see. And there's the ovary has three carpels, and the fruit is a capsule with three or more seeds, and it blooms in panicles or heads. Do you have heavily compacted clay soil, soggy areas, salt-injured lawn grass, bare areas due to foot traffic, deer? Well, Path rush might just be the right plant for the right place at your home. It's aptly named because it's commonly found along footpaths, ATV trails, roadways, railroads, dirt parking lots, lake shores. I promise if you've gone hiking in this area, you have either stepped on or over this plant many, many times. Gets no respect. It's slender or poverty grass, juncus tenuous, and tenuous is Latin for slender. And you can see in the, the picture on the right, you can see those six tepals and the ovary in the middle. Juncus tenuous is found throughout all of the United States and Canada. It grows in full sun to park shade and it can grow from a half foot to two feet high and wide. It actually likes infertile soils that can be medium in moisture to wet and even poorly drained. It has a bunching habit and like many other plants spreads by rhizomes. It's native to thickets, woods and swamps. A nickname for it is wiregrass, although this is a true cool season rush. It's called wiregrass because of its tough stems and it has grass-like foliage. It can be propagated by seed or division, and again, deer resistant and without serious pests. Wildlife consume the seeds, and it's interesting that when these seeds get wet, 
they cling to fur, shoes, tires, whatever. And this is how it gets spread along these trails. And wildlife also use it for cover and nesting material. It can be used as a tough lawn replacement, as a ground cover for erosion control, soil stabilization, can also be used in rain or water gardens with native iris, cardinal flower, even swamp milkweed, the yes. Asclepias um, incarnata. So I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you, Suzanne. Your love and enthusiasm for native graminoids certainly came through and it is shared by many in the audience who have a lot of questions for you. Okay. First question is, can you transplant Indian grass and how do you get all the root? I wouldn't try it. It's just the roots are just too deep. Unless it's growing on a rock. <laughs> No, it, it, the roots just are too deep. I wouldn't try it. The question was about your wonderful diagram of the roots of grasses as compared to lawn grass. And the question I would like to know, with such deep roots, how would they work on roofs, on roof gardens? You wouldn't be using those. You would not be using the deep-rooted grasses on, on, a, on a roof. You'd want the shallower ones. Many of the cool season ones that had the shorter did not have the the deep roots. You need to understand the kind of roots of a grass or sedge that you're planting to know whether it would be a suitable. Will little blue stem tolerate road salt? Less well than others. Now, I believe you've talked about this some, but someone would like to ask if you could talk about when and how to cut the seed heads of these grasses without negatively affecting skippers and other lepidopterans. Well, the, the skippers and the other lepidopterans are eating the, the leaves. The seed heads are not being consumed by them. So you would just be cutting the, the, the seed heads and not affecting the foliage at all. They're feeding on the foliage and hiding at the, at the base of the plant. So you can remove the seed heads without hurting them. Do you have any comment on the switchgrass north wind? It's one that does not lodge over. It's a lovely grass and it there are places where it would, it would work very well if you've got a narrow space or you want a ver very strict vertical accent, that would work very well. How long does it take switchgrass to get established? It de well, for one thing, it depends on the size of the plant you start with. If you're starting with a plug, it may take several years. If you start with a, you know, a gallon pot or bigger, it may be a couple of years. Mine have been in the ground about eight years and in in by my utility box, I'm not supposed to plant it there, but they are there anyway. They're, they're huge right now. They're huge. And that would, it took them eight years, but you know, they, they do very well. They've done very well. Again, the size that you start with, if you've got the patience and, and or if you're limited budget, start with plugs or, or the, or the ports. If you've got more money, start with a gallon size. You'll get faster results. Well, one questioner would like to plant a row of grass at the top of a hill to screen their property from a road behind them and would prefer to use big blue stem rather than little blue stem. Do you have any thoughts about this? Um, you can use big blue stem. And I mean, it's a great grass and that would work very well. And, and it can be a thug and take over a garden, but in that situation, it would be fine. How deep are the roots of sedges? That's a good question. Uh, I have seen the ones I have grown have no more than eight to 12 inches, the ones I have grown. Pennsylvania sedge shallower, maybe six inches. I don't know all of them. I just, I'm familiar with the ones I have grown. But again, you can look that up. And there's a lot of great information available on the um, internet on plants, but do stick to um, university sites or organizations, the .orgs, to get your information. And at the end, I can show, I have um, some references, some great references for people. Sorry, I didn't turn this up earlier. Um, the Bill Kulina book is very good and the Dick Clark's book. Several people asked about whether any of the plants that you've discussed can outcompete stilt grass. And in particular, one person wondered about perhaps Pennsylvania sedge. It's worth trying. I, I don't know. I don't have stilt grass growing on my own property, and I have not, see, I have not seen 
still grass growing with native grasses and sedges. It's usually just been in the shady areas where the forbs are growing. So I, I don't know. But I, I'd say if anything's gonna do it, you know, something rhizomatous like Pennsylvania sedge that can make such a nice ground cover, it's certainly worth trying. And if you can cover the ground and keep those seeds from germ, the still grass seeds from germinating, I would try something like Pennsylvania sedge. Well, the next question is like sedges in SC, I guess that's South Carolina. Do all sedges have spiky burrs as a downside? No, they don't. Can any of the grasses you've discussed compete with wiregrass, also known as witch or Bermuda grass? I think maybe cement would work. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. How do the grasses do against zoysia turf if the zoysia is removed with a sod cutter? Will the zoysia return or will blue stem um, or other grasses seeded over win out? I would try it and see what happens. I've not had experience with that. Someone else would like to know what grass should I use to camouflage fading daffodils in part shade? Hmm. Well, any of the, the cool season ones would work. You know, the um, bottle brush, for example, would work, or the wavy hair grass. Bottle brush gets pretty tall. Something like that would work. When any of the cool season ones would do better in the shade than the warm season ones. As a lawn replacement, can Juncus tenuous be mowed? Yes, it can be. You wouldn't do it frequently. You wouldn't need to be doing it frequently. Would a sedge be a good candidate to plant on the edge of a dry creek? Yes, it would be. I, I have my, I have my um, seersucker sedge growing along my dry creek. It's very happy. The only thing I would mention about um, seersucker sedge or the plantaginea is that if it gets too much sun, the leaves will, will burn and it doesn't matter how much water you give. So it does need some shade, but it would work very well. And it's very pretty along a dry creek sedge, along a dry creek. That's where I have mine growing. Uh, someone else would like to know how much should we water the grasses just after planting and how do we know when they're established? <laughs> um, well, I would say the first year, if it doesn't rain, I would give them a drink every couple weeks. And I mean, if it looks like it's wilted, then maybe more often. But again, if it's a plug, it's going to need a small plug. It's going to need more water than if you're planting a gallon sized pot. But it, after the first year, it should, they should be fine. Remember, they're gonna be putting those big roots down into the soil and, and they, they can tolerate it. Another audience member is looking for a grass for a rain garden. Is there only one kind of rush that is native to Maryland? No, there are many rushes that are native to Maryland. I can't give you a list, but it's available, look it up. You just didn't have time for all the rushes. No, I didn't. It was hard to cut is what I did. It um, what's your appetite? Well, I think it certainly has. Um, in the coastal plain, what yeah. is best to recommend to neighbors to replace their turf grass? They want to be able to mow it down to three to four inches because they're afraid of ticks. And the questioner says, help. Pennsylvania sedge could work. It doesn't get that tall but it, it can take the sun if it gets enough water. Uh, next question, can you transplant Flavin's tridents? How readily can it be propagated by seed and when do you harvest and plant? You can harvest in the fall and you can plant in the fall or in the spring, the seeds. It doesn't have that deeper root system, so I would think you could, you could transplant it, it can, and it can be divided. It, it's just so amazing to see that up close. It's such a beautiful dark color of the, the seeds are so pretty. Someone is asking whether any of the sedges or rushes will tolerate moderate foot traffic as a lawn replacement. Well, I mentioned that the Pennsylvania sedge could do that, but they not they won't tolerate the heavy traffic, but I you can put like pavers or stepping stones so that you do have a pathway through it. But none of them will take, you know, the, the heavy traffic of uh, our typical Kentucky blue or, or zoysia or other grasses. Any suggestions for 
native grasses that could compete with the non-native Miscanthus sinensis? You know, they have such an advantage. <laughs> they're, they're, um, they don't have anything if, uh, eating them or attacking them. They're, they, uh, it's really tough for these native plants to, to outcompete the non-natives because they, they just, I, I, I don't know if that would, anything is possible. There's not been all that much research done on this, on these subjects. And I hope that they will be done now that people are waking up to the importance of grasses. There are many, many questions about where to purchase native graminoids. And would you like to comment on that, Suzanne? Yes, Watch, when you shop for plants, I always ask where they came from. And, you know, make sure that if it's a plant that it was grown from seed, was responsibly, or the seed was responsibly harvested. And I like to support the native plant sales like Loudon Wildlife, the Black Hills Park. And then you can go online to get the seeds from places like Burnt Seed, but they sell only in large quantities. The Maryland Native Plant Society has a list of nurseries that sell native plants. And if you have, with permission, you can collect seed. And I've given you some references there for how to, how, to, how best to collect seeds and make sure that you're doing it with, with permission. Most, most parks will say, you know, don't take any, any plant part from, from them. So do it legally. And, and also I, I mentioned that, you know, the different, the, the coastal plain, the Piedmont and the mountains, Try to get, if you can get seed sources from the air, they're from the particular region you're in, you're going to have better luck. A plant that grows best in the mountains, but grows in the, in the coastal plain may not be, may not be the same provenance. It doesn't, it will not grow as well, maybe on the coastal plain as it did in the mountain, but there would be seeds from plants on the coastal plain that would do well for you. We have a comment in the chat that uh, chasmanthium is the only grass that they have found that can outcompete stilt grass. Oh, good to know. Any suggestions for short replacements for liriope in full sun? I have, I have to think about that because the, the shorter ones are, are the sedges and most of them do not do well in full sun. I, I, I'd have to think about it. I'm not, not, I'm not sure if I can answer that one. There were actually several questions about aggressive spread. And this one in particular, how aggressively does purple top spread? And it must spread pretty well because it does do well along highways and you know that that's not getting well managed. So I would say it'd be more aggressive than some other grasses because remember it does spread by rhizomes. But I have not heard that it was, I've not read anywhere that it was terribly aggressive, but I would think that it does make, it would make a pretty heavy, pretty good ground cover fairly soon. And again, if you did it by seed, it would depend on how quick, how heavily you seeded, how much ground cover you would get. And now we'll just take one more along the same lines. And this questioner asks, is footpath rush aggressive? It is being recommended by landscapers for rain garden maintenance paths. Will it spread and take over the other native plants in a rain garden? Hmm. I, I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that question. And like I've said, I a lot of these grasses have not been studied and I do hope that people grow these things and we'll start reporting their success and that we do have more information about it. I've, I know it's recommended, but I cannot tell you if it's going to take over the whole thing. I don't know. It's a tough plant. Thank you, Suzanne, for fielding an astonishing variety of difficult questions with ease and for a wonderful presentation. There are many expressions of thanks and gratitude in the Q&A in the chat. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Good night.